Good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. And for all of you who are dreaming of a white Christmas, uh, you got one driving in, though of a different sort, I suppose. At any rate, a wonderful foggy morning this morning. Let me pray and I'll get started. Lord, thank you for this morning. Uh, We thank you for your grace, for your kindness. We thank you that you are a God who makes and keeps covenant, that you do not go back on your promises, you do not go back on your word, uh, you do not change in your character, in your attributes, in your purposes. Lord, we thank you that you have set your love, your affections on us through the gospel of your Son, and that we are secure because you have said, because you have determined, because you have planned, because you have purchased with your own blood a people for your own possession. And so all who are in you can trust in you. Lord, we pray that as we finish up our study of Israelology this morning, that you would be glorified, that your purposes for recording for us the things that you have would meet their end in our own hearts, uh, that we would find you to be trustworthy, and that the result of that is we would entrust ourselves to you and trust you not only for the big things, uh, but for all the details of life as well. Uh, You are a trustworthy God who holds the universe uh, under complete and sovereign care, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we've been looking at the study of Israel in our Bibles. We've looked at Israel in the past, the present, this morning. Uh, Our plan is to finish up this study by looking at Israel in the future. And we've seen that the topic of Israel, uh, the word used some 2,700 times in the Bible, is a, a very important and sometimes neglected study of theology in our Bibles. In the number of systematic theology textbooks I have on my shelf, None of them have a chapter dedicated to something like Israelology, uh, even though Israel is a prevalent topic throughout the Scriptures. When we were looking last week at Israel in the present, I want to finish off that section by asking two important questions. And the first is this, what does modern Zionism and the establishment of the modern state of Israel in 1948 have to do with the Bible? Is this biblical fulfillment, is the establishment of a national state of Israel in 1948 a fulfillment of biblical promises? And I want to point your attention to two texts, the two texts which are primarily given in answer to that question. Uh, There are those who would say that 1948 was absolutely a fulfillment of Scripture, and here I'll give you two texts uh, that lie behind that. The first is Isaiah 66, 8. Isaiah 66, 8, and a series of rhetorical questions in a context of absolute hopelessness in terms of the future of Israel given her apostate spiritual condition. And God says, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in a day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. And the series of rhetorical questions is seen at times as a a prophetic look towards a future day when Israel as a land, as a geographical entity, as a national entity, would be born in a single day. And and many would point to uh, May 1948 as the fulfillment of that idea. One more text is Ezekiel 36. Beginning in verse 22. God writes through the prophet Ezekiel, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, 
Then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares the Lord Yahweh, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Uh, That is a very clear promise of a regathering, a regathering of Israel as distinct from the nations into the land of Israel by God. Uh, something that has not yet been fulfilled. It was future to Ezekiel's day. Uh, It was future from the time of the New Testament. The question is, is that fulfilled May 14th, 1948? A a regathering unto the land. In answer to this, I will just say to you, uh, I don't know. Does the Isaiah passage, um, was it fulfilled in 1948? Was the Ezekiel passage fulfilled in 1948? Or any other text that we might point to that indicate a future regathering of Israel? Has that been fulfilled in modern times, in the 20th century? We do know from the timeline of end times events in the Bible that Israel will be regathered. And that the nation of Israel will be regathered into the land of Israel as a precursor to the end times events that are detailed in Revelation 6 through 19. And the reason that I would say I don't know if 1948 is a fulfillment of these prophetic events is that we don't know if Israel will once again be squashed and dispersed to the nations. We don't know if there will be more holocausts to come. We don't know if there will be more genocidal attempts to remove them from the land. We don't actually know the timeline. And anyone who would say 1948 was absolutely a fulfillment of Scripture and we are on a countdown clock towards the end is saying too much in my view. Now, it could be a fulfillment of biblical prophetic promises to regather Israel to the land prior to the end times. How and when will we know that? when the end times come about. Then we could look back at 1948 and say, yes, see, God did regather them to the land in preparation for the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem so that all the events that the Bible describes in the end times will come to pass. But to say that we know from our vantage point that 1948 fulfilled that, in my view, is saying too much. We just don't know. And this gets into the one of the dangers of thinking about eschatology and speaking about eschatology. At times, we can discredit the things the Bible clearly say, says when we begin to, I believe, misidentify events. One of the great dangers of a study of eschatology is taking out the newspaper, reading the headlines, and looking for verses that the headlines fulfill. In fact, when the, the events of Matthew 24 and 25 occur, the events of Daniel's 70th week or Revelation 6 through 19, when they occur, it will be so clear and unmistakable that no one will deny it. Just as we looked at last Sunday morning, uh, the people on the earth at that time, the earth dwellers, will actually climb into the caves and the rocks and demand that the rocks fall on them because they would rather die than repent. And what they will say is, the day of God's wrath has come. The day of the wrath of the Lamb has come. It will be unmistakable, they will know. So, for us to say 1948 was a fulfillment of of biblical prophecy, um, I would just say maybe. Right now, we we live in the period where Israel is apostate spiritually. What 1948 does prove is that Israel still exists as a distinct entity, as a distinct ethnicity, uh, a culture, a people. Um, God still has a plan. A second question we might ask about modern Israel or present day Israel is this, is modern national Israel the object of God's promises? And I mean the the modern day nation state of Israel, the one you find on a map that has a prime minister and a Knesset and they're in the headlines. Are they the object of God's promises? Well, in one sense, yes, there's no other ethnic Israel than the one that populates the land of Israel. But you add to that all the dispersed Jews throughout the world that also make up that people. However, the present state of Israel is in such a moral corruption and a rejection of the gospel and in a state of having rejected her own Messiah that she is not the object of God's affectionate 
promise-keeping intent currently. She will be one day, and that's where we will go next in our study of Israel's future. But you have to keep in mind that God will not keep His promises to Israel because they are special, simply, hereditarily. Any Jew that gets to heaven, for instance, gets to heaven in our present day, according to Romans 2.29, circumcised inwardly one who believes in the gospel, one who is part of a remnant of faith, like the Apostle Paul, or like any Jewish Christians in our own day, who have actually embraced Messiah and become part of the church. Jew and Gentile are together in one body in our present day. There is equal footing between Jew and Gentile in Christ, in the body of Christ, that is the church. So the nation of Israel is not uh, favored geographically, politically, um, militarily today because they are faithful or because they're keeping covenant or, or because they are God's people in the sense of the special grace in the gospel. In fact, all those things are, nationally speaking, untrue about Israel at the moment. What did we find out about them last week from Romans 11? They are actually enemies of the gospel and yet beloved for the sake of the fathers. And that culminates in what God is going to be doing with Israel in the future. Let's turn the corner this morning. And as we think about Israel in the future, I wanna go back to the past, all the way back to Deuteronomy, and, and just remind ourselves that Israel's future rebellion was foreknown by God. In other words, Israel's apostasy was not a surprise, as if God made covenant promises with the people, if, if you obey me, then I'll bless you in the land, and if you disobey me, you'll be cursed. I can't believe they disobeyed me, now they're cursed, they're not my people ever again. That is not the promise. In fact, all the way back in Deuteronomy 30, this again is the establishment of God's covenant with His people. This is before they enter the land. God is fully aware of what they will do. Deuteronomy 30, beginning in verse 1. It shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where Yahweh your God has banished you, and you return to Yahweh your God and obey Him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then Yahweh your God will restore you from captivity will have compassion on you, and will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahweh your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the end of the earth, from there Yahweh your God will gather you, and from there He will bring you back. Yahweh your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. God knew their rebellion and their dispersion. Before they ever rebelled, before they were ever dispersed. This is critical to understanding how God intends to keep His promises. God is not going to transfer His promises to someone else because Israel blew it. When God made the promises, He said, you are going to blow it and I will keep my promises to you. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. beginning in verse 63. It will come about that as Yahweh delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, so Yahweh will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Moreover, Yahweh will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you and your fathers have not known. Among those nations you will find no rest. There will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. There Yahweh will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul, so that your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you will be in dread night and day, and shall have no assurance of your life. In the morning you will say, would that it were evening, and at evening you would say, would that it were morning, because of the dread of your heart which you dread, for the sight of your eyes which you will see. Yahweh will bring you back to Egypt in ships. By the way about which I spoke to you, you will never see it again. 
and there you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. So pretty dramatic picture that God paints as the people are about to enter the promised land. Physically, they go and they enter the land. They never have it all to the geographical proportions that were promised. Before they even get a fulfillment of the promises, they are disobedient from the heart and in their behavior, and God removes them from the land. And you might think for a moment, well, wait, when they came back from Babylonian captivity, Isn't that the return of the exiles that's promised here? And the answer to that is no, the details fall apart. They're not united as 12 tribes in the land with physical blessing and prosperity, more numerous and more prosperous than their fathers. And then we'll find out the other outstanding promises that have not yet been fulfilled. The exile from Babylon, by the way, did not return them into a land with geopolitical autonomy. That is, they did not own and possess the land. They had overlords, uh, from the Persians to the Greeks to the Romans. Uh, They still, uh, all the way through history, did not have their own land. And while they are a geopolitical autonomous nation today, they don't possess the land. They don't possess all of the land that God promised, not even close. There are things still to come. God warned them about their future rebellion and their dispersion. And next, God also expressed a confidence in Israel's restoration. Look back at Deuteronomy chapter 30. We'll begin again in verse 4 and we'll read through verse 10. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there Yahweh your God will gather you, and from there He will bring you back. Yahweh your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. Yahweh your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall again obey Yahweh and observe all his commandments which I commanded you today. Then Yahweh your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand and the offspring of your body and the offspring of your cattle, the produce of your ground. Yahweh will again rejoice over you for good just as he rejoiced over your fathers. Again, promises that have not yet been fulfilled. The frustration and cursing of all of Israel's enemies and the physical and land prosperity of Israel in the ground that God promised. And look at verse 10. In fact, if you're looking at at an LSB, a legacy standard Bible, I think you have an accurate uh, correction of the text here. It should read, For you will obey Yahweh your God to keep His commandments and His statutes, which are written in this book of the law. For you will turn to Yahweh your God with all your heart and all your soul. This is God's promise. Remember back in Deuteronomy 10, God told them, circumcise your hearts. He is demanding a supernatural internal work of regeneration that they themselves had no natural ability to fulfill. And yet it is their obligation. It is the obligation of every human. Make your heart soft before the Lord. And in Deuteronomy 30, God turns around in verse 6 and says, I will circumcise your hearts. We have in there a a microcosm of the gospel. The absolutely right and appropriate obligation of our creator on every single person created. We ought to love God with our whole heart. And we find in ourselves a fundamental inability to do it. And what happens when you believe the gospel? When you trust in God's Messiah to save you from your sin, you find that God changed the heart. He circumcised the heart. He did the supernatural work on the inside to give you the ability and the desire to obey the gospel, to believe in His Messiah. And God promises He will do that for Israel. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23.
beginning in verse 5. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely, and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called Yahweh our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when they will no longer say, as Yahweh lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as Yahweh lives, who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I have driven them. Then they will live on their own soil. And notice in this text, uh, the combined nation of Judah and Israel reunified and under a monarch in the land. That has never yet happened. And think about that. Today we have, uh, you know, movies starring Charlton Heston uh, with the Ten Commandments coming down from Sinai celebrating the Exodus. What movies will be made in the future? Not the Exodus out of slavery in Egypt, but the return of the dispersed apostate nation of Israel from all over the earth back into the land under the king. That's still coming. And that's a promise for Israel's spiritual restoration alongside of their physical restoration. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20. Verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. I will bring you out from the people and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. All of that language was the same language God used of the Exodus. This is another Exodus coming. Verse 35, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. This is a, a remarkable time that Israel will be restored And it will come with difficulty. Verse 36, As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord Yahweh. And I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. This national restoration is coming. Look at Acts chapter 1. It's interesting when we get to the New Testament, we might be tempted to ask the question, okay, Messiah came not as a conquering king, but as a suffering servant. And the door is open for forgiveness of sin for every tongue and tribe and nation and people, and the Gentiles are flooding in. Does that mean God is done with Israel? In Acts chapter 1, at the beginning of the expansion of the church, this new entity with Jew and Gentile together, We get this scene where Jesus, after the resurrection, is speaking with his disciples. Verse 3, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. That's an interesting phrase. What is this kingdom he's talking about? Is this the, the general idea that God is king over all things? He's the sovereign over the universe? Or is this the same kingdom that was promised in the Old Testament and affirmed by Jesus himself in his earthly ministry? Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And when they came together, the disciples were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? This question comes from the disciples after 40 days of instruction with the risen Christ. And and if at this point we're, we're to see something different about the kingdom, then Israel restored to the land and Israel given new hearts and, and political uh, prosperity and, and financial and agricultural blessing. If we're to expect something other than that about the kingdom, 
something other than Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, as king, ruling from Jerusalem over Israel and Judah and the combined tribes. If we're to expect something different, this is a great opportunity for Jesus to say, hey, disciples, you've misunderstood the kingdom. The kingdom is a spiritual reality in your hearts, not a physical reality on the earth. He doesn't say that. What does Jesus say? He said to them, verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, Jesus says, there's a time, there's an epoch that is fixed by God for the kingdom. In the meantime, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. Lord, is it at this time that you're going to reign in Jerusalem and Judea, just like was promised at your birth, just like the Old Testament said, and you're going to reign over the nations? It's not for you to know the time or the epics. For now, you'll get power from the Holy Spirit, and you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. What are they witnesses of? The fact that the king came, died for sin, rose from the dead, and went away to a far country, like he said in the parables, and will return. In the meantime, what are these witnesses? Ambassadors of the king, proclaimers of the coming kingdom, the ones who were taught to pray, Lord, let your kingdom come, the ones who look forward to it, anticipate it. This does not negate the kingdom. This affirms the kingdom and demonstrates that God keeps his promises. Jesus will come back and reign, just as all the scriptures said. Look over at Acts chapter 3. Peter is preaching here. And he says, Repent and return, verse 19, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Messiah appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. There's a period of refreshing, of regeneration that Jesus comes back to bring about. God's people in this era now become messengers of that coming time. Do you remember the scene after the resurrection in Luke chapter 24? Uh, On the Emmaus Road, the disciples are walking and Jesus is walking with them. Uh, They don't recognize him. He sort of cloaks himself from their uh, ability to perceive. And do you remember the kind, loving, ironic, patient rebuke? He says, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets said concerning Messiah. I think it would be foolish of us to neglect all that the prophets said concerning Messiah. Even as we are now quick to embrace his suffering at the cross, we must not forget his reign as king that is coming to the earth. Those Emmaus Road disciples just had the recipe flipped. They knew all that the prophets said about the king, and they were disappointed that he died and was gone. What happens next? We live in the in-between times, and we must embrace all that the prophets said about Messiah. You see, the future of Israel is tied up in the future of Israel's Messiah. Our anticipation of Israel's restoration and regeneration not only is in keeping with God's heart for his people, but is in keeping with his plans for his son to reign on the earth. The third element we'll look at this morning is what is coming in Israel's future is an intensified trouble. An intensified trouble. We, we might call this a purging. We, we read it about it already where God said he would meet them in the wilderness and discipline them. Several places in the Old Testament bring out this prophetic element. Jeremiah 30, chapter 7, calls this period of time the troubling of Israel or the troubling of Jacob. He says, 
Alas, for that day is great, there is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. Jacob is the old word for the man named Jacob. He was renamed by God. Do you remember that? We looked at that the first week. He was renamed Israel or the one who wrestles with God. Here that old name is given. Uh, Why do you think the old name is given? Why is it Jacob here? I I think this is probably a reference back to Jacob being a a conniving kind of guy. There, there is a, a, a spiritual death in Israel that must be troubled, that must be shaken. And God here says, there is none like it. And when you think about all of Israel's history, from the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way down to the present day, all the way down to October 7th of 2023, Jacob has been troubled <laughs> The 20th century was awful. The 21st century is a time of troubling. All the way back through the Middle Ages and the times of Babylonian captivity and Persian overlords and the Greeks and the Romans and Antiochus Epiphanes. I mean, the whole history of Israel has been a time of troubling. But Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, There is a day coming that is great and there is none like it. Think of all the awful days of Israel's history. And nothing compares to what is coming. It causes one to shudder at the thought. What is God going to do? He's going to shake up this nation. Look at Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah 13, 8 says, it will come about in all the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested, and they will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say they are my people and they will say Yahweh is my God. A look to the future when two-thirds of the nation will be cut off, destroyed. They will perish from the land. And a third that remains will be refined. Refined unto what? Refined unto belief. Refined unto faith. Micah chapter 5 spends six verses detailing that day when God will bring down all of Israel's military defenses so that the nation will not be able to defend itself against its enemies. That's part of the purging, part of the troubling, to do away with a a self-assured ability to protect themselves. They will not be able to look to iron dome defenses, to fortresses, to technologies. Those who will be saved will have to look to Yahweh alone as their defense. The fourth element we'll look at this morning in Israel's future is Israel's national generational repentance. Again, it's clear from the scriptures that Israel doesn't get in with God simply because they're Jews. We've known that all the way throughout history. Uh, The doctrine of the remnant demonstrates that there were many, in almost every generation, there was a majority of unbelief in Israel and there was a segment of those that God saved by grace through faith. The doctrine of election demonstrates that not everybody born of Abraham goes to heaven. Not everybody born of Isaac goes to heaven. Not everybody born of Jacob. Uh, There is a descendant of Israel that God keeps through faith. And so a future national generational repentance of Israel is no different. It just simply means that God brings en masse an entire generation of Jews to faith in Messiah. We'll see this in a few places. Look first at Ezekiel chapter 16. Beginning in verse 60. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then I will remember your ways... Then, excuse me, you will remember your ways and you will be ashamed 
when you receive your sisters, both your older and your younger, and I will give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. Thus I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am Yahweh, so that you may remember and be ashamed, and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation. When I have forgiven you for all that you have done, Yahweh God declares." It's a stunning promise. It makes it clear that it is not on the basis of Israel's natural spiritual condition, but only on the basis of God's promise. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 39 to 44. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord Yahweh, go, serve everyone his idols, but later you will surely listen to me. And my holy name you will profane no longer with your gifts and with your idols. For on my holy mountain, on the high mountain of Israel, declares the Lord Yahweh, there the whole house of Israel, all of them, will serve me in the land. There I will accept them, and there I will seek your contributions and the choicest of your gifts with all your holy things. As a soothing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered, and I will prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. And you will know that I am Yahweh when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the land which I swore to give to your forefathers. There you will remember your ways and all your deeds which you have defiled yourself, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for all the evil things that you've done. Then you will know that I am Yahweh when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways or according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel, declares the Lord Yahweh. Now the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Teman in the south and prophesy against the forest land of the negative. There God is bringing about curses to the southern portions of Israel that were rebellious in the prophet's own day while at the same time affirming, in the future, they will believe, they will repent, they will see their own sin and loathe themselves over it. A few pages to the right, Ezekiel 36. Beginning in verse 24. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances." You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. I will not bring a famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree that is uh, than the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that you were not good. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord Yahweh. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, Yahweh, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, Yahweh, have spoken, and I will do it. These are stunning promises that cannot be separated In other words, you you can't take the spiritual promises of heart restoration, heart circumcision, a new heart, sprinkled clean, forgiveness of sin, and remove it from the land promises. They're tied together in these texts. Israel united as a nation, restored to their land uh, geographically, living under the king who is Messiah, 
all predicated on their having new hearts and believing God. Israel will not get into blessing apart from faith. And when they have faith, they will also experience the blessing that God promised. Look at Ezekiel 37, starting in verse 21. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king for all of them. They will no longer be two nations. They will no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols or with their detestable things or with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. And they will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. And they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons, forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst. These words are very clear. God makes promises about himself, about his presence, about the nations, and about Israel. Promises which have never yet been fulfilled. And it's tied not only to the land, but to their heart condition. Look at Zechariah 12. In verse 10, Zechariah 12.10 gives us the mechanism by which God will bring about Israel's soft-hearted readiness to be recipients of divine promise. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This is a remarkable text. Notice the pronouns here. They will look on me. It's capitalized in our English Bibles. It's a reference to Yahweh back in verse 8. They will look on me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced. That word pierced is a rare word, only happens a couple times in your Bible, and is associated in both cases with the crucifixion. It occurs here and in Isaiah 53. They will look on Yahweh whom they pierced, and they, Israel, will mourn for him. Did you notice the change of pronouns? They will look on me whom they pierced and mourn for him. That's kind of funny grammar, but it fits It works if we understand that Jesus, the Messiah who was killed on the cross, actually is Yahweh in the flesh. They will look on Yahweh and and mourn for him and mourn for him as for an only son. That's familiar language for us who love the New Testament, the only son. All of this is Old Testament promise about Israel and about Israel's thoughts about Messiah. What did Israel say when Messiah came the first time? Crucify him. What will, we, what will they say as a prelude to his coming the second time? We killed him. It's a stunning admission. It's a confession that could only be brought about by the spirit of grace and supplication. I want to turn now to what I've hope is a very familiar text, Isaiah chapter 53. In 
And for much of my life, I had been in the habit of inserting my name, my identity, into the pronouns of Isaiah 53. This is the song about the suffering servant. Notice verse 4. Surely our griefs he bore, our sorrows he carried. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced, there's that word again, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. By his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep went astray. If you're like me, you, you recognize the language of substitution here. This is substitutionary atonement. This is the means by which God gets sinners saved. That a suffering one suffers in the place of the sinner. The only way the sinner is forgiven is if that justice and that punishment goes somewhere. And here in this text, it, it goes on one who suffers like a sheep before the slaughter. And you, and you feel your own sin if you're in Christ and you recognize what a travesty it is that, that Jesus, the innocent, would go to the cross in the place of me, the guilty, so that I could be forgiven. And so it's understandable that we would take the language of this song and, and insert ourselves as the sinners into this passage. And, and by implication, there, there's a legitimacy to that. Anybody who gets saved ought to be able to sing this song. But if we're paying attention to the context, and we think back to verse 1 of chapter 53, who has believed our message? Who is the our in chapter, three, uh, chapter 53, verse 1? It is the nation of Israel. In the context of the book of Isaiah, this is Israel's song. And this is not a song that Israel sang the first time Messiah came. A number of years ago, John MacArthur preached this text and pointed out these pronouns and said, don't change the pronouns from their original meaning. This is Israel's song. And this is a song that they have not yet sung. The spirit of grace and supplication has not been poured out nationally to bring about regeneration. They are not singing Zechariah 12.10. They have not yet as a nation looked on Yahweh whom they pierced and mourned for him as for an only son. They have not yet loathed themselves in their own sight over their sins. The nation in its present state is spiritually apostate. They're not in faith. But when Israel sings this song, in the future, it will be because of faith. It will be because of regeneration. It will be precisely because the Spirit of God has been poured out on them so that they cry out for mercy. And this is all in line with Israel being separated, dispersed, and cursed, and then one day in the future being troubled and meeting with God in the wilderness and called to account, and then coming to grace. And so listen to this from the lens of Israel in the future, thinking back on the nation having rejected Messiah. It was Israel's Messiah. The, the message of the suffering servant was actually Israel's message. And they will cry out, who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? He grew up before God like a tender shoot, a, a, a branch that nobody believed would be anything like a root out of parched ground. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? They said. He had no stately form, nor majesty that we should look upon him. He was worthless, despicable. He didn't have an appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men. Who despised him and forsook him? He came into his own and his own received him not. His own people. He was a man of sorrows and he was acquainted with grief. He was one like one from whom men hid their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. What does 1 Corinthians 1 say about the Jews? They look on a crucified Messiah as cursed of God. Surely 
our griefs he himself bore. Our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Anyone hanging on a tree is cursed. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, think about this, as for the generation in which he came, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Nobody did. Few did. His grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering and see his offspring. He will prolong his days, the good pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the plunder with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. What will it mean when Israel one day sings Isaiah 53? I mentioned last week, um, Jews today in Hebrew school are encouraged not to read this chapter, prohibited from reading this chapter. They are not taught the prophets. They don't, as a course of habit, read the prophets. The prophets detail their hope. And when God troubles them in the wilderness, they will turn to their only hope. As a Gentile in the 21st century, I still read Isaiah 53 with personal attention. It was my sins that he bore. And if not for grace, I would be in the same cold-hearted, spiritually dead, apostate condition as God's people Israel. So what do we do as Gentiles? Don't despise the natural branches. Rejoice, we say, I don't belong here. This is all of mercy. And a day is coming when Israel, in turn, jealous of Gentile inclusion in God's plans, will turn to Messiah and believe, Romans 11, 27, all Israel will be saved when God forgives their sins and gives them new hearts. Israel's future is to be nationally included in grace. Now that promise doesn't mean every Jew who's ever lived past, present, and future will go to heaven. Far from it. The only Jews who ever go to heaven are those who have embraced God's saving message by grace through faith. And that is only ever predicated on the finished work of Jesus, Israel's Messiah, on the cross. And those in the Old Testament who believed God's provision of substitutionary sacrifice, they trusted God. And Jesus was the future payment for their sins. And those who look back on the cross... We trust in God's provision of substitutionary atonement. We can't look to anything we have done. We can't look to any of our own righteousness. Just as Israelites can't look to their heredity, you and I can't look to Christian parents or Christian culture or church going or affiliations or anything else to save us from God's wrath against sin. We must only and always look to this suffering Messiah as our substitute on the cross to fully pay for sin. As we wrap up our study of Israelology, I want to close with Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and an encouragement there for all of us. A 
A study of Israel has not only practical import for us in looking to the future, in believing our Bibles, in having hope, but something related to our theology proper or what we believe about God. Here's Malachi 3.6. For I, Yahweh, do not change, God says. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. I'll go back to the original question this morning. Does May 14th, 1948 fulfill some biblical prophecy? Well, in the sense that Israel is not yet consumed, we might say yes. What does it demonstrate? God does not change. And the reason that God is patient with Gentiles who are alive today, the reason the world still spins is because Jesus, the great shepherd, is still about getting his sheep. And he doesn't change from his purposes. And the reason Israel still exists as a nation, as a distinct entity on the earth, despite everything that's gone on in their history, is because Yahweh doesn't change. What does that mean for us? Uh, Again, back to our discussion of, of the connection of Israel's future to Romans 8. All the promises God makes. They don't get altered. They don't get transferred to somebody else. They stand for the people to whom he makes them. And we can trust him. Lord, we thank you for today. Uh, We thank you for even the season and what it means to remember that you came to earth to accomplish your purposes. We reflect on uh, the misery we would be in apart from your incarnation, apart from Christmas. If you hadn't come to the earth we would be hopeless and helpless and still dead in our transgressions and sins. We thank you that you are a good God who, have, who has looked at us in our worst condition, in our miserable state, and have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.